Hello and hey, ladies and gentlemen. I am Professor Jellyfish and welcome to another part in a realism review of Subnautica. This is a series that will be examining the creatures in Subnautica and try and figure out how realistic they are when compared to real life animals. This is a series that will not only look at the design and look at the creatures, but it will also consider the biomes and the environment that they are found across in the game's world. This time we will be looking at the boomerang fish. At first glance, this fish does seem to resemble the butterfly fish, and the color scheme is similar to the regal blue tank. A fish that was made iconic in the Dixar Pixar film Finding Nemo and was also featured as a main character in the sequel Finding Dory. But of course, there are some important differences. First and foremost is that the boomerang doesn't have a tail fin, and it also seems to have four eyes. Looking into the databank, the ends of the two fins are described as being the ends of the digestive tract. The fins are also described as being made of cartilage. The teeth of the boomerang are also described as being serrated to allow the boomerang to grind down the cores that the herbivores are unable to digest. It's also stated that the boomerang is a fish that often forms skulls, or a schooling species in more technical terms. Again, let's look at each one of these aspects of the boomerang fish and examine them to determine how realistic they are. So, let's start with the serrated teeth. There are some herbivores in our oceans that have and use serrated teeth to chew on tough plants. An easy example is the common snee snail. They do have a tongue that is serrated with sharp teeth that help them grind down plants they then normally feed on. However, these teeth are not suitable for grinding down or biting down our corals. On our planet, coral skeletons are made from calcium carbonate. These structures are very strong because they usually inhabit environments with strong currents. The corals in the Subnautica are described in a similar manner to the corals we found in our own oceans, in that they are a colony of microorganisms that come together with form structures that are used to guard, gather nutrients. Given this, I will assume that they are made of the same materials that, as the corals in the oceans. Despite their hard shells, there is a group of fishes that are adapted to eat corals and even bite through them. These fishes are known as the parrot fishes. And as we can see, the parapet does not have serrated teeth. Rather, it has two sets of large, almost beak-like teeth, hence of course its name. It is by concentrating the force in such a manner that the parrot fish is able to bite through large chunks of coral in order to digest it. So the boomerang having such small and serrated teeth makes it unsuitable to eating corals. The serrated teeth would be far more effective if the fish ate more soft plants or perhaps some flora that had a harder or exterior shell. The second problem that comes up here is that the boomerang fish is classified as a herbivore. Now, I can certainly see what the developers are intending here. They probably know that corals in shallow water usually live in symbiosis with algae that they house within their own bodies. The reason for this same biotic relationship in our own oceans is because most tropical corals live in very nutrient-poor environments. They need aid from the algae in order to survive and harvest more nutrients. The algae benefit from this because they get protection in the form of a hard shell and the burning polyps that extend from the coral's mouth. But that also means that when the boomerang is eating the corals, it is eating both the plant and the animal at once. This immediately makes it an omnivore, an animal that eats both primary producers, in this case the plants and the algae, and secondary producers, in this case the polyps inside the coral. To summarize the previous two points, the eating habits and methods by the boomerang are not only unrealistic, but they are also wrongly classified. Moving on to the part of the boomerang having four eyes. This is another strange part of the boomerang's designs. Of course, almost every vertebrae on our planet only have two eyes. And the reason for this is that the common ancestor of all vertebrates only had two eyes. And from what we know so far, not a lot has changed in the billions of years of evolution. However, on an alien planet, the common ancestors of a lot of animals may actually have had more than two eyes. And if we have a look through the general fauna of planet 4546b, we discover something rather interesting. There are in fact multiple species that have more than one pair of eyes. Examples are the Biter, the Blighter, the Ghost Leviathan, and of course the iconic Reaper Leviathan. What does this tell us? Well for one, it appears that a lot of creatures might have shared some common ancestor because of the shared trait of two pairs of eyes. Following this assumption, we might then draw the conclusion that creatures with multiple sets of eyes are in fact relatively common on this planet. 
So now that we have determined the plausibility and realism of the boomerang having four eyes, what utility might these eyes have? Well, in game, the boomerang often swims with its fins oriented vertically, meaning two of its eyes will be looking upwards while the other two will be looking downwards. This would give the boomerang a fairly large field of view from both above and below. And this would likely be used by the boomerang in order to spot incoming predators and orient itself better in the water. It would also be used to better find the coral that it eats. However, with the increasing number of eyes, there also comes some downsides. The problem with having multiple eyes is that it takes more energy to process the information that the fish receives from those eyes. In this case, it will be more taxing on the creature's brain. This means that the boomerang is more than likely going to be very instinctual and unable to perform complex behaviors. This is an observation and nothing in the games implies that the boomerang is capable of anything more than just swimming around and avoiding predators like the player when they approach. Another utility for the eyes could be in the schooling behavior. The multiple sets of eyes would help it keep track of individuals around it. This would also make it better at following the other individuals in its school and far more effective at coordinating within the school. Now, on to the glowing ends of the boomerang's fins. What is the bright idea to put them there? Well, here again is something rather strange and something I should make a remark on, on now as it will become more prevalent as we go further into the series. The sheer amount of bioluminescence in-game is what I would call rather absurd. The bioluminescence does occur on our planets today. In fact, in Sweden we have something called Mar Eld, or Mirror Flame, a phenomenon that occurs when algae is disturbed and produces a small amount of green light. The reason for this is a means of confusing potential predators and making them swim away from the algae. This also leads me into the general function of bioluminescence. There are three common functions. The communication between other individuals in the species, for example to attract the mate or convey a mood. To confuse predators, as already mentioned, they can make the predator confuse and helps the prey's items survive by escaping. And the final is by luring prey. This is something you might have seen on deep sea anglerfish where they use rod like extensions on their dorsal fins in a manner similar to fishermen. But that also leads me to the issue I have with the bioluminescence in Subnautica. Bioluminescence not only takes energy for the organism to produce, but it also puts it at risk of being spotted by a potentially larger predator. This is why it is usually used selectively by creatures that produce it, and why it does not occur on all organisms. It is also common for organisms that exist in environments that have natural lighting. This will be further elaborated on in future episodes where I will explain why it is strange for some creatures to have and use bioluminescence considering the environments they inhabit. There are also organisms that should have no uses for both Luminescence considering their roles within the ecosystem and their biology as described by the in-game databank. But back to the boomerang. The bioluminescent that it has gathered up at the ends of its digestive tracts are located towards the tips of the fins. And this is rather strange. There doesn't seem to be any clear openings to the digestive tract. Yes, I am wondering where the boomerang's butthole is. The idea of having it, the digestive tract run so close to the edge of the skin though is actually realistic. If any of you are underwater photographers, you might well know of which group I'm going to talk about. The group is, of course, the nudibranchs. These snails without a shell actually have the digestive tracts running across the spines on their backs. And why they have this is because a lot of nudibranchs actually eat a lot of knirdia, like corals and anemone, or perhaps you know the great group better by my grandpa, the lion's main jellyfish. Then they take the knudicides, which are the part that burns when you touch crap on the wrong sides and store them inside the spikes on their backs. This then acts as a dispense for the nudic prank and gives us a precedent for creatures having intestinal cracks close to their skin. Now, the pictures you have seen here have been pictures I've taken myself. A little shameless self-promotion, I know. But this is of course not the same usage of the intestinal cracks as on the nudic branch. But the bioluminescence on the boomerang actually has a possible utility. Like I said previously, one of the usages of bioluminescence is communications between the species. And the boomerang is said to be a schooling species, so it has a reason to be communicating with other members of its species under reduced lighting circumstances. It would also help to keep track of other individuals in its school. It could also be used as a means of confusing predators. But from what I have observed, the boomerang fish never adjusts its brightness of the bioluminescence. Secondly, 
I know of no stationary creatures that actually produce bioluminescence, and it is stated that the boomerang collects the bioluminescence from the corals that it eats. For reasons stated previously, I see no reason why stationary coral that in no way perceives lightning would have needs to produce bioluminescence. So while the bioluminescence in the boomerang has a utility, the source of its bioluminescence is rather unrealistic. Moving further, is the environment that the boomerang fish inhabits a fitting for its biology? The answer to that is yes. Oh, you want the long answer? Alright. The boomerang fish is described as living on corals, which means it has to live close to the corals that it eats. So the boomerang fish living in the shallow biomes is very realistic. The part of it being a schooling species is a little bit unusual because a lot of schooling species live in more open waters in order to maneuver better, but it's not unusual for schooling species to move into shallow waters. The bright color of the species are not unusual either because the pattern would help individuals blend together and make it harder for potential predators to pick out a single individual. So to conclude, the parts of the boomerang that are unrealistic are its diet, the way it eats, where it's gathered by luminescence. But the four eyes, the schooling behavior, and the users of bioluminescence are realistic. All in all, it's a split between realism and a little bit more unbelievable fiction. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, and share it. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.